Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining Corporate Connect. I'm Eileen. I'm your host for today. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Fraser Logistics and Commercial Trust, as well as our audience from Facebook Live. This webinar is organized by SIAS and supported by SGX Group. We will kick off today's webinar with a presentation by Mr. Jeff Howey, market strategist from SGX Group, on the recent market highlights, followed by the corporate presentation by Mr. Robert Wallace, Chief Executive Officer of Fraser Logistics and Commercial Asset Management Private Limited, Ms. Trisha Yeo, CFO, and Ms. Ng Chung Kiet, Vice President, Investor Relations, and we will end off with a QA and a session. Fraser Logistics and Commercial Trust is a Singapore-listed real estate investment trust. We have a portfolio comprising 105 industrial and commercial properties worth approximately 6.7 billion, diversified across five major developed markets in Australia, Germany, Singapore, and UK, and of course, uh, Netherlands. The investment strategy is to invest globally in a diversified portfolio of income-producing properties used predominantly for logistic or industrial purposes located globally or commercial purposes primarily in CBD office space or business park purposes primarily on non-CBD office space and or research and development space located in the Asia-Pacific region or in Europe, including UK. This afternoon, we will hear from them on the company's latest business update. But before this, let's invite Mr. Jeff Howie to give us an overview on how the market performed. Over to you, Jeff. Hey, thanks very much, Eileen. Let me just uh, share my screen and proceed. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As per usual, uh, my part in this will be a quick 10, 15 minute uh, overview of the Singapore REIT sector, which will be, of course, um, based on facts and educational material. So um, I guess just to kick off, uh, as we've seen this year so far for the first 11 trading weeks of the year, uh, REITs have continued to attract more than their fair share of investor activity. Uh, the sector represents 12% of the total market capitalization of the Singapore stock market, but uh, does contribute more than 20% of the day-to-day -day turnover of our stock market. That 12% contribution uh, to market cap and the 20% contribution to uh, daily turnover is comparatively high uh, for some global perspective. Going into this year, uh, there was some two trillion US dollars of market value of global REITs listed across the world, representing uh, two, around 2% 2 of the global stock market value. Um, and REITs, of course, they've been in the, in the States since the 1960s. And while they make up, um, while those United States based REITs make up about a quarter of the 800 REITs listed across the world. Uh, the US listed REITs do make up 60 to 70% of the total market value of all the REITs, the 2 trillion US dollars. Thus, the US REITs and their relevant drivers do have a significant impact on the overall tide of uh, perspective on the global REIT market in terms of investors' uh, valuations, fundamentals, and so forth. In Singapore, there are as many as 17 of these trusts that exclusively invest in property assets outside of Singapore, and 20 of the trusts invest in properties both in Singapore and outside of Singapore, and the remaining three REITs are investing purely in Singapore. This includes as many as 14 of the trusts that have properties in their portfolio in Australia, which uh, Fraser Logistic Commercial Trust reports um, approximately half of their revenue to, which, which uh, Fraser Logistics and Commercial Trust will talk about soon. Um, across the broader S-REIT sector, about 80% of the trusts own and manage overseas assets um, from across Asia Pacific, the US and Europe. S-REITs are now one of the most international REIT markets and of the nine diversified uh, trust and REITs that we have listed here, the combined geographical footprint of those nine diversified trusts uh, extends to as many as nine countries. As Singapore REITs and property trusts have continued to diversify in terms of this, I guess, asset mix uh, over the past three years, Diversified S-REITs now make up the largest sub-segment of our REIT market. Uh, more diversification can, of course, improve a REIT's resilience 
to uh, to external shocks and obviously allow it to capture growth and trends across a multitude of different segments. Uh, 40 uh, REITs and property trusts of the sector that are actively traded ended February with an average gearing ratio of 37.7%. 30 um, and as of the end of February, those 40 actively uh, traded S REIT and property trusts uh, on, on the whole were below the regulatory limit of 50%, which um, is the minimum interest coverage. That's, that's the uh, leverage ratio. If the minimum interest coverage ratio, the ICR is at least two and a half times as imposed by the MAS. So if the ICR is below two and a half times, the maximum allowable limit is 45%. And ICR is simply used to determine how easily uh, the manager can pay interest on its outstanding debt. Um, the limit was last increased in April of 2020, nearly three years ago, and that was to provide the sector with more flexibility to manage their capital structure during the, um, the endemic. So uh, also, I guess, among the 40 trusts, all of them have gearing ratios, as I said, within the regulatory limit, um, but half of them, 20 trusts, have obviously have ratios behind, below the sector's average. And those three REITs with the lowest gearing ratios across the 40 are Sasser REIT, Fraser Logistics and Commercial Trust, as well as Paragon REIT. So despite the backdrop of increasing interest rates, S REITs uh, ha with its sector average dividend yield of 7.6% are still offering a higher yield spread of between 250 basis points to 300 basis points above the Singapore government 10 year bond yields. The last four years have seen also when we look at the uh, chart on the right, the FTSE ST REIT index price to book ratio which is represented by the green line on this right chart. It's basically the price, the, the book value has alternated from a 20% premium to book value to a 20% discount to book value and back to a 10% discount book value as of present. Um, and that's a small marginal premium to the median discount uh, to book value that those 800 global REITs are trading at. So last year, um, the dampening of economic expectations, it did see the FTSE ST REIT index PB uh, decline to 0.84 times or a 16% discount to book value in October of last year, at the end of October. But China's ensuing economically supportive business-friendly policies and the marginally less hawkish US rate outlook for much of pretty much the past five months has seen that FTSE ST REIT index discount to book value narrow to around five to 10% to book value, but it's still significantly shy, obviously, of that 18% premium to book value that we saw back in January, 2021. By sub-segment, uh, office REITs do maintain the highest trading dividend yields at present, while hospitality REITs maintain the second lowest yield. Um, but the recent earnings season did reveal that hospitality segments saw the highest median uh, DPU distribution per unit increase of 32%, while healthcare and diversified segments were also resilient, um, seeing averages of 1.6% for healthcare and 1.5% year-on-year growth uh, for diversified, the, the nine diversified uh, trusts of the S-REIT sector. Uh, four of the five trusts that did actually report the highest year-on-year -year DPU increments for the whole FY22 were hospitality trusts. And those were ARA US Hospitality Trust, CDL Hospitality Trust, Capital Land Ascot Trust, and Far East Hospitality Trust. All of the four hospitality trusts did report higher year on year revenue per available room or unit uh, in the FY. And that was due to the recovery in tourism and international travel in their respective operating markets. Uh, reopening momentum really did matter. Uh, because when you look at the geographical split and the trusts with the majority of assets in Singapore were among the most resilient with median increase of around 2.3% in DPU year on year, but the trusts with 100% assets in China saw the biggest median drop in DPU of 19%. So uh, looking versus other asset classes, um, generating very similar returns, the FTSE ST REIT index to the FTSE EPRA REIT developed index. Um, but 
while they have been generating, while the two indices did generate similar returns since the end of 2019, they have not been very highly correlated. So uh, the FTSE Apronar REIT developed index to the local REIT benchmarks, the IHS REIT index, the FTSE ST REIT index, the cor daily correlations have been quite weak since the third quarter of 2020. Um, I think the average 120 day correlation coefficients well below a quarter, well below around below 0.25. So it basically implies that there is a lack of day-to-day -day correlation yet highly competitive returns. And this, this has seen the um, diversity of our S-REIT sector provide very much a viable platform for global REIT portfolio managers, uh, which is in line, of course, with our branding as a uh, global hub for, for REIT listings. Um, just in terms of the resilient returns and the, the, the different um, the different uh, moves in sectors and sector switching that does provide investors with opportunities um, and and diversified returns when you do look at the uh, the different sub segments, not just within the REIT but the overall stock market. Um, with the focus on U.S. banks, uh, mid-tier banks, and their profitability during the um, during the especially during the second half of last year, which saw the ECB hike its policy rate by 300, three policy rates by 300 basis points, as well as the Fed uh, lifting its policy rate by 450 basis points since March. Looking at the profitability, there's obviously been um, quite a bit, uh, a little bit of a uh, notch up in the financial stability risks, um, which has been, I guess, well contained by central banks across the world, basically uh, making improved liquidity measures uh, and important announcements to set the tone of the market. And now that's seen for the last seven and a half sessions, the SDI drop to below 3,200. Uh, within a trading range, though, of 3,200 to 3,100. Um, and if you look at our REIT sector for those seven and a half sessions uh, since the 9th of March, there's been as many as 13 trusts of our S REIT sector that have actually posted gains uh, against the uh, overall choppy uh, trend that we've seen in the market. So those gains for the REITs uh, over the past seven and a half sessions, they have actually been led by Fraser Logistics and Commercial Trust, uh, followed by Keppel DC REIT, Maple Tree Logistics Trust, Capital and Ascendus REIT, and then Maple Tree Industrial Trust. So, so that's my uh, quick 10 to 15 minute overview. And if you would like more information and more reports, please do scan our QR code. Uh, because as we said, we have a very diversified uh, REIT market, not just by the different properties that they're investing in, but obviously in where those properties are located in the world uh, and much to, much to share with you in terms of educational notes on a week-to-week -week basis. Thanks very much. I look forward to hearing more from Rob now. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, may I now invite uh, Mr. Wallace and Tricia as well as uh, CK? Thanks, Eileen, and um, thanks everyone uh, for joining us today. I'd particularly like to thank uh, CS for uh, providing this forum for uh, engagement with our um, very much loved retail investor base. Uh, so I'll be uh, going through the front part of uh, this uh, presentation deck, and I'll also um, finish off with a couple of other slides at the end, and in between, both Tricia and Chungkeek will uh, address a number of slides as well. But uh, without further ado, just uh, going through a, a snapshot of where FLCT is at at this point in time, you can see that we are actually uh, located in five developed countries. We have 105 properties. Our portfolio value is just under seven billion Sing dollars uh, in value. It's a well-occupied uh, portfolio. Actually, it's got its occupancy rate just below 96%. And our whale, which is our weighted average lease expiry, uh, is 4.6 years across the portfolio. Uh, we've got a very green portfolio at uh, FLCT. Uh, we have a net zero carbon commitment uh, by the year 2030. And we have a five-star GRES rated portfolio as well. And you can just see on this uh, uh, world map here where our assets are located. Uh, as Jeff said, the bulk of our assets are actually located in Australia. Certainly by number, there are 65 properties in Australia. Uh, they represent just over 50% by value. 
We have one property uh, in Singapore being Alexander Techno Park, that is a commercial property. In Germany and the Netherlands, they are all uh, industrial logistics and industrial properties. Uh, total number for those two countries is 35 properties. And in the UK, uh, we have three business parks and one logistics property as well. Going to the next slide, you can just see here our track record. Um, we've had around about five billion Sing dollars worth of accretive acquisitions uh, since our IPO, which is on the 20th of June, uh, 2016. We've also been actively managing our portfolio. Uh, in fact, we uh, have divested over the six and a half year period, about 1.3 billion uh, Sing dollars uh, worth of divestments. And in fact, our last two divestments uh, were done in 20, I'm just trying to remember here, 2022 from memory. Uh, and they included Cross Street Exchange, uh, which was divested an asset in Singapore. We sold that for 810.8 .8 million Sing dollars, just under a 30% premium to its book value, as well as uh, another property in Port Melbourne uh, in Australia. Uh, that property was sold for uh, about uh, just over 40 million uh, Australian dollars, uh, and that was almost a 100% premium to uh, book value. But I won't well, uh, talk you through uh, this slide in detail. There's a lot of detail there, but you can see it's been a busy period over the last six and a half years or so. So just having a look at our logistics and industrial portfolio, uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, that is the bulk of the portfolio, represents around about 70% or just, just under 70% of the portfolio uh, in value. Uh, we have 97 logistics and industrial properties uh, they are located in Australia, as well as Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK. The total portfolio value in Sing dollars is 4.6 billion uh, Sing dollars, has a long whale of 5.2 years. And to show you the strength of the industrial market in the markets that we are in, uh, the portfolio as of 31 December uh, was 100% uh, occupied. I suppose the theme across our industrial properties uh, really is the fact that they are well located modern uh, industrial assets uh, well suited to their uses and the markets that they are in. And you can see actually on the table across uh, on the right hand side, just uh, where the assets are located by count. And you can see that Australia, as I said, is the uh, largest market, certainly for industrial. We've got 61 out of the 97 industrial properties uh, located in Australia and uh, it has a, a good healthy whale of 4.3 years. I think an important thing as well to look at uh, with our industrial properties is both the fact that uh, they do have growth under their leases. And in fact, in Australia, our leases have uh, averaged 3.1% uh, annual growth uh, as contracted in those leases. And in fact, in both Germany, uh, the Netherlands and the UK, we have uh, reference to CPI indexation. Uh, the other uh, point I'd like to raise as well is the fact that a, a significant proportion of our assets are actually freehold assets and you can see that there is shown uh, in the bottom as well on that table. Uh, briefly moving across and looking at our commercial uh, portfolio, uh, that represents eight uh, properties in total. We have two CBD properties, uh, one being in Melbourne, Collins Street, Australia, another one being a 50% stake in Central Park in Perth, which is actually uh, Perth's tallest building. And you can see a picture of Central Park actually in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide. Uh, the portfolio has a value of 2.1 billion Sing dollars. Uh, for a commercial portfolio, a, a good whale of 3.6 years, and uh, its occupancy is just under 90% at 89.8%. Uh, you can see in the table on the right-hand side uh, where those assets are located. Six of the eight are actually office and business parks. Uh, one of our largest assets is 100% um, leased to the Australian government in Canberra. Uh, another asset, a more recent acquisition, is uh, 545 Blackburn Road uh, in Melbourne. Uh, in Mount Waverley, uh, that property is 100% occupied. And then we have uh, uh, our property at Alexandra Techno Park in Singapore, 
which is a, an asset uh, that has a while of 2.2 years and it's quite a sizable property uh, with a value of 662 million uh, sing dollars. We also have three uh, business parks uh, in the UK, uh, one being uh, Farnborough Business Park and Max, another being Max's Business Park in uh, the UK Southeast, as well as Blythe Valley Park, which is actually uh, located outside of uh, Birmingham. I've spoken to the two CBD commercial properties uh, as well. Tricia, I might hand over to you for uh, just a review of our capital management. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. Um, so just in terms of our aggregate leverage, uh, we are actually one of the we have actually one of the lowest aggregate leverage amongst the S V universe at twenty seven point nine percent. Our cost of borrowings has been stable. Um, this is we compute it based on the trailing twelve months basis. So this uh, trailing twelve months average is about one point seven percent. Our average rated debt maturity is about two point seven years um, on the chart. Uh, on the bottom right, you can actually see our maturity profile. In terms of our percentage of borrowings that we have hedged or at, at fixed rates, um, it's actually a high level of 78.7%. In terms of our interest coverage ratio, we are at 13.6 times. So again, one of the highest, but um, that's if we um, actually excluded the gain of divestments that we had in FY20, um, FY22, um, that number remains higher about 8.4 times. The debt headroom that we have to 15% aggregate leverage limit um, is actually 3.1 billion. But um, just looking at a very conservative uh, aggregate leverage of just 35%, we still have a headroom of about 770 million. Uh, we are also rated by um, S&P. We have an investment um, rate rating, triple B plus with a stable outlook. So just looking at our debt maturity, um, our financial year end is actually 30th of September. So for FY23, uh, most of the refinancing has already been done. For the FY24 stack, um, the maturity is actually more than um, 12 months away. So that full 537 stack that you see there is only maturing in um, June and August 2024. So um, we do hope that uh, we continue to see rate adjustments. Well, we hope that there would be rate adjustments downward by then. Um, but having said that, we are also just talking to banks to um, just explore refinancing options uh, at the same time. Um, so where we look at uh, interest rates, every 50 basis points increase in our interest rates uh, because we do have floating rate borrowings, the exposure of about uh, 21%. Um, this will impact our DPU by about 0 0.06 Singapore cents. Yeah, so on the next slide, I'll hand over to CK who will help provide the operational update. Thank you very much, Tricia and Rob. So um, I'm moving into an update of our most recent reporting quarter. Uh, I thought to share for clarity purposes as well that the financial year for FLCT starts on the 1st of October of each year and ends 30th of September. So um, you might be interested as well that our dividend announcements are typically made alongside our half year and full year results, uh, which are typically in May and November of each year respectively. So um, what I have here is our first quarter business update ended 31st December 2022. Uh, you can see on the slide for the period, leasing momentum across our assets were high with about 240,000 of space leased or renewed. And in line with the strong demand and market growth we are seeing across our key um, geographical markets and asset classes, rental reversions for the three month period also came in positive, 2.8% uh, on an outgoing versus incoming basis and 11% on an average versus average basis, respectively. So if I point you to the bottom left-hand side of this slide, uh, we are very proud of our portfolio metrics. Um, I'm rehashing what Rob had covered earlier, but from a sustainability lens, we are five-star crispy rated. We are ranked number two across Asia Pacific for office slash industrial. Uh, we also have the highest green star performance rated portfolio in Australia. Uh, separately, MSCI, had also independently assessed our portfolio and given us a double A rating in 2022. Uh, 
portfolio metrics wise, uh, rehashing what Rob had covered earlier, our average occupancy across the portfolio is at about 96% and supported by a long wheel of 4.6 years. Um, pointing you to the right hand side of this slide, uh, this gives you a high level look into our portfolio where it's quite clear that we do like logistics, which accounts for about two thirds of the AUM in FLCP. So uh, while multinational in nature for our portfolio, we do prefer developed markets and that's where you currently find um, all of our assets. So one thing that's not in this slide, but I thought to be highlight again, is that the advantage of FLCT's portfolio is that all of our assets are, or a large proportion of our assets are predominantly freehold in nature. 75% of the entire portfolio is freehold. Over 20% of it has long-term leasehold. When we say long-term, that means longer than 75 years, leaving just a small percentage of about 3% that are either short, shorter term leasehold. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, this is an illustration of our key ongoing forward funding and development projects that FLCT has invested in. Uh, all three of them are currently in the UK. Two of these being Connection 2, the one on the left-hand side, and Worcester 6, the one in the middle, uh, were near completion when we did our first quarter reporting in early February. And I'm quite happy to share with you that uh, both projects have actually since reached uh, practical completion uh, over February and March. So moving on. The, following, the next slide here covers the, uh, in greater detail the leasing activity that we have done over this period. Uh, one key thing for FLCT is that we do not like vacancy or too much downtime. So we have kept our portfolio managers um, pretty busy, closing 19 deals during this period across all five markets that we operate in. I uh, mentioned earlier that the reversion numbers are pretty healthy for both L and I and commercial. Uh, and the average uh, reversion we are seeing for the REIT in the first quarter is 2.8% on an incoming versus outgoing basis. When we say incoming versus outgoing, it means the new signing rent of the new lease versus the expiring or we call it terminal rent of the preceding lease. So this does not factor in any step ups that we may enjoy on the new lease. That's coming in at 2.8% across the portfolio. And when you take an average of what's the average rent for the previous lease versus the new average rent for the new lease, is coming in at 11% across the portfolio. Moving on, uh, this is a showcase of our lease expiry profile. There are minimal expiries coming up in the current year, uh, and we are obviously prioritizing the 4.6 per 7% that is due. Uh, on the right hand side as well, you will see a listing of our top 10 tenants. Majority of them are, or in fact, all of them are well established names that I trust you all know quite well. Uh, we have no sing significant singular exposure to any one tenant. Uh, Rob had covered earlier, our largest tenant is the Commonwealth of Australia, being the, the Australian government, and they fully occupy our property in Canberra. Uh, Google is our second largest tenant, accounting for 4.1% of our income. Uh, some of us would be aware of the challenges that Google is facing recently, and uh, we actually provided a subsequent update in February that Google is surrounding part of the space that they lease our property in Singapore. Um, there's a 12-month window before that surrender comes effective in 2024, and this impending vacancy is something that um, of leasing importance for us right now. So we're working on it. I will cover the rest of the tenants here. Uh, on the next one, this is on occupancy. Uh, our LNI assets are 100% lease and commercial is at about 90%. Um, if you were to look at the chart below, on a sequential basis, um, looking at that table, movements across um, since 30th of September to 31st of December, quarter on quarter has been quite stable across Singapore and Australia. Uh, I may only just highlight that one of our smaller properties in the UK, which is just 1.4% of portfolio value, being Maxis Business Park, um, actually um, has seen a slight dip or rather a significant dip in its occupancy from 100% to 66%. Um, this is largely attributable to the downsizing requirements from the tenants operating there, and we are working on getting it leased back up. Then with that, uh, I have reached my final slide before I hand it over to Rob to sum, sum up the presentation. Uh, one thing to mention here is that ESG has definitely grown in importance over the years to um, corporates and the wider public at large, but importantly, it has consistently been a core of FLCT's business. Um, since um, coming, uh, we have a net zero target in place by 2030, and at the same time, we also put in place a sustainability strategy since 2017 with very specific goals and targets to measure our performance. So these targets are actually published in our annual report and sustainability report, as well as published on our website. I would encourage you to have a read of it. On the green and sustainable financing front as well, we have made good headway. Currently about 65% of all of our borrowings are um, some form of green or sustainability linked. 
And at the same time, in 2021, uh, we also issued our maiden sustainability notes for 150 million. Uh, on the right-hand side, that recaps against um, the SASTI metrics that the overall portfolio has. It's a very well-rated portfolio, as we had shared and Rob had covered earlier as well. Um, we had also earned very strong BM and neighbors ratings for our commercial properties across the region. Um, with that, I'll let the hand over back to Rob um, to cover the outlook and our strategy. Back to you, Rob. Uh, thanks, CK. Um, we, we take this opportunity with this slide just to talk through some of the uh, the key themes that uh, we see impacting uh, FLCT uh, and the uh, the markets that we are in. Uh, one thing that's really top of the list there that you can see is uh, forex volatility. Uh, Ninety percent of FLCT's income is sourced from outside of uh, Singapore. Uh, through property income. And obviously over the last 12 months or so, we've seen uh, quite a, a bit of strength in the, the Singapore dollar and uh, that will have uh, and has had uh, an impact on both our distributable income and our NAV uh, as a result. Uh, rising interest rates is something that uh, Jeff briefly touched on and is something that's top, top of mind uh, with everyone. Um, FLCT uh, and our peer group are not immune ultimately uh, from rising interest rates as Tricia uh, has touched upon. We are quite well hedged, but uh, you can only hedge for a certain period of time. And uh, should interest rates still remain elevated uh, into the future, obviously as those hedges unwind, uh, that as well would have an impact on uh, distributable income um, for FLCT and our peer group. Uh, we're all also aware of uh, the geopolitical tensions that are uh, occurring around the world, both in Asia and more so in Europe. Uh, and obviously that tends to uh, have some impact on the uh, global out, uh, market outlook. And we've seen uh, probably more of that impact uh, in 2022, although it's still bouncing around into 23 as well. Uh, the final thing on that list, uh, and one thing that's is not as pronounced as it was certainly during, uh, as Jeff called it, the endemic, uh, is the growth of e-commerce. Um, it does depend on which market you're in as to what future impact that would have. Certainly in a market like Australia, where we have a big industrial presence, uh, we have seen, still seen uh, continued uh, growth, uh, albeit from a, uh, a smaller, um, initial position of the e-commerce sector. And we still see that there is good continued demand uh, from e-commerce occupiers and would anticipate that that would continue and the growth and spend uh, would continue in markets like Australia uh, going forward. So if we move through just to uh, what is our final slide in the deck, and this is really just to reiterate to you our strategy for long-term value creation. And that is really harnessing the advantages that we have. And we really do at FLCT strive to deliver stable distributions and achieve long-term uh, growth uh, in our uh, unit price. Uh, reasons to invest in FLCT, as I said at the start, is the fact that we are quite an active manager. Uh, we've bought in excess of uh, 5 billion SING dollars worth of accretive acquisitions. As I said, that's been done since uh, June 2016. We are an active portfolio manager. Uh, we are ultimately property people, uh, over 1.3 billion uh, SING dollars worth of uh, strategic divestments since IPO. And we have a uh, green portfolio as touched upon by CK earlier in the deck. Uh, looking at some of those competitive advantages uh, that I, uh, I was talking about, we are one of the largest S-REITs. Uh, we've got a portfolio of 6.7 billion uh, SING dollars worth of logistics, uh, industrial and commercial assets in developed markets. We have strong portfolio metrics, uh, just under 96% occupied and a long while of just over four and a half years. Uh, as Jeff touched on, uh, we have one of the lowest gearing levels amongst our S-REIT peers. Uh, we have a strong balance sheet uh, and a good staggered uh, debt expiry uh, profile. And uh, I suppose importantly, uh, we've got a good track record of uh, growth 
and a committed uh, management team and reputable sponsor being Fraser's property and not to be ignored. Uh, we have uh, been able to generate uh, stable distributions and uh, currently uh, trading at a yield of at or about 5.9%. Eileen, that is the uh, presentation uh, for the investors and I'll uh, hand back to you and I think you'll be handing over to Benjamin to moderate. That's right. Um, thank you, Robert, uh, Trisha, and CK for the corporate presentation. Um, may I now invite Mr. Benjamin Gold, Head of Research and Investor Education from SIAS to moderate the Q&A. Participants, uh, you may input your questions in the Zoom Q&A box, or you can um, also click on the link at the Facebook to join and type in your questions. Uh, we will try to answer the question as, uh, as many as possible. Over to you guys. Well, thank you very much, Eileen. Uh, very warm welcome to uh, Rob and uh, uh, CK as well as Trisha. Uh, good afternoon to you guys. Uh, very grateful for you to be able to join us, uh, especially uh, for Rob. It's always a treat to have the uh, top dog, so to say, so to speak, to uh, you know uh, answer questions from our retail investors. Um, we're going to start with the pre-submitted questions and then move on to the questions that we're getting through the uh, Q&A function in Zoom. Now, the first question is related to the current environment of elevated inflation as well as high interest rates. Uh, this is especially so in Europe. So the question is, how does the um, high interest rates and inflation uh, in Europe, uh, what kind of impact does that have on the REITs assets? Sure, um, Benjamin, I might field that one. Um, yeah, so interest rates are significantly higher in the UK against where they were, uh, let's say, two or three years ago, uh, when it was uh, certainly a, a very good market to, to get a lot of leverage out of um, assets there. So really what we um, have seen as a result of the, the higher interest rates is, I suppose, a drifting in values or cap market capitalization rates uh, as a result, mm -hmm. which does put pressure on values uh, the higher the cap rate gets. The one thing I would say is that volumes of sales has, have actually been quite low over the last six months or so. Um, and we're starting to see a trickle of sales come through at the start of calendar year 2023. And I suppose a little bit surprisingly, they're actually a little bit firmer than what I thought they would be given where debt costs are. Um, so whilst there has been a drift in property values out, uh, in cap rates, I should say, and then hence values going down, they, they haven't gone down as much as perhaps I thought they would. Um, we're still, what I would uh, suggest, are in a, uh, a discovery phase, still waiting to see once the volume increases a bit more, where the property values would be. Um, the other interesting thing is obviously interest rates are elevated as a consequence of higher inflation. Uh, and as we did say uh, earlier in the presentation, a lot of our European leases actually have reference to uh, CPI indexation. So uh, a lot of our properties are actually enjoying the, the higher, or the owners, I should say, are enjoying the higher CPI increases. Um, and that has actually helped uh, income growth for, for those properties. Mm. Okay, um, thank you very much for that. Uh, obviously, a big factor or um, you know concern for investors nowadays is the high CPI and interest rates. Um, okay, moving on to a different question. Um, so, um, Rob, you have tendered your resignation. So the question here is, um, what is the, or rather the succession plan? <laughs> Uh, to replace the, uh, you know, the CEO's position and, uh, you know, how's that going? Sure. Um, and uh, must I say, it, it, I, I must say it is a, a very hard decision I made to uh, tender my resignation. Um, I, I've been with FLCT since IPO and uh, in a macabre way, I think it's my baby. Um, and it's it's very hard to send, uh, say goodbye to uh, uh, something that I, has been a very important part of my life, and I'm very proud of what uh, we have as a team have been able to achieve over the last seven years. So 
my leaving uh, FLCT is not uh, in any way or form uh, a consequence of uh, any uh, any view of uh, uh, FLCT's non-performance. More so, it's uh, as the release said at the time. Uh, factors that uh, really mean that uh, it's more necessary for me to return back to Australia. Uh, but in relation to uh, my successor, uh, and I will still be around, by the way, for an, uh, another two and a half uh, months, uh, the, the, the company uh, is uh, quite well advanced in relation to uh, finding a uh, successor. And I am confident that uh, in due course, they will be making an announcement of someone who will be uh, very capable uh, of fulfilling uh, the role of CEO for FLCT. Okay. Um, all right. Um, as uh, phrases, logistics and commercial trust is a read, there's always going to be a question about distribution per unit. Um, so perhaps uh, you could provide some color as to what is the outlook for DPU growth uh, in the next uh, one or two years. Yeah, uh, I'll field that one as well, um, Benjamin. Um, obviously, we, we're unable to actually give guidance in relation to uh, to DPU, but we can obviously talk about factors that would impact uh, DPU. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of positive. Uh, factors uh, that do does help uh, FLCT. And one thing is, we didn't talk through the slides, is the strength of the Australian industrial market um, at present, where we're seeing uh, market rental growth, uh, probably at the strongest levels I've seen in my career, to be honest, uh, in Australia on the East Coast, uh, in the Mel Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane markets. Um, but that is uh, counteracted by uh, weakness that we're seeing uh, in the business park sector uh, in the UK, where physical occupancy levels of uh, office stock uh, have been quite low um, compared to what they traditionally are. Um, the other thing to note, obviously, as I said during the, the presentation, two other factors that uh, will impact our DPU. And one thing is obviously the weakness of uh, our source uh, income currencies against the Sing dollar being the Australian dollar, the pound and the euro. Obviously the Sing dollar has been quite strong uh, comparative to those over the last 12 months or so. And the other thing to mention, which is something that would um, uh, affect the REIT universe uh, uh, is interest rates. Um, and whilst we can hedge, which we have against uh, elevated interest rates, um, they are certainly a, a lot higher than they have been over the last few years and that will um, impact uh, DPU for FLCT and uh, our peers, uh, should they remain high uh, into future years. Mm, okay. All right. Uh, moving to the property portfolio uh, itself, there is a question about the Singapore part of the portfolio. Um, so this investor has noted that there is only one property in Singapore, albeit is the big one, the Alexandra Technopark. Um, so are there any plans to uh, expand FLCT's uh, um, ex well, footprint in Singapore? We, we like the Singapore market and we like our asset in Singapore being Alexandra Technopark. Um, it it uh, has always leased well uh, and it's well located. And certainly its rents are at a very nice price point um, in regards to the market. Um, if there was uh, a, uh, an opportunity that did pop up in Singapore that ticked the right boxes, it would be certainly something that we would uh, look at. Um, we've, we've always uh, just found it a little bit difficult in Singapore, just balancing the leasehold nature of the assets against the, the returns that they do generate. Uh, we do like to um, to buy hopefully accretive assets uh, from the initial purchase period. Um, it is something that we will continue to to look at at FLCT. Um, it's just a matter of finding uh, the right property that works and comparing that to other opportunities that we have in other markets as well. Mm, sure. Okay. Um, the office. Uh sector uh, plays a big part in your property portfolio. Um, there is a question here about what is the strategy for the uh, office uh, section of your portfolio and what are the, what is the outlook for this kind of assets? Um, 
a couple of points on this to begin with. Um, certainly from a growth viewpoint, as we've been saying over the last 12 months or so, we will grow with a bias towards industrial. And hopefully you can see that in the acquisitions that we have made and hopefully we'll continue to make. Um, that industrial will be um, the preferred asset class uh, for future growth with uh, FLCT. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be very, second point to make would be very unlikely that FLCT would look to grow through CBD commercial um, asset purchases going forward as well. Having said all that, um, looking at the commercial properties that we do have on balance sheet, we do think um, that there is a future for those properties with FLCT at this point in time. Uh, I don't think it's the market that you would look to divest in in any case uh, at this uh, moment, given where um, yields are at um, and in comparison to the cost of debt and the uh, pricing discovery that we're phase that we're going through in many markets that we're in. Um, the one thing I would say about our, in our commercial properties in comparison to our industrial is that there's some pretty good quality assets there that are actually yielding quite well comparative to, to those uh, industrial properties. And you know, I could make mention of, uh, say, uh, Central Park in Perth, which is yielding around about 6% uh, plus, as well as our uh, property at Caroline Chisholm Centre, which is certainly uh, yielding a lot higher than what we're seeing uh, with our industrial properties as well. So whilst it's not an asset class that um, we would say is driving the growth of FLCT, uh, we do see that there, uh, there is reason to hold those properties, particularly at this point in time. Mm, okay. Uh, related to that question about office property, um, what is the impact of the uh, working from home uh, trend uh, these days. Uh, do you see this trend dying out? And uh, you know, how does that impact the um, outlook for office property? That, that's a good question, uh, Benjamin, and one that's very uh, topical uh, around the world. And it does differ um, uh, not just in countries, but in various parts of the countries, uh, of countries itself. Um, we do keep a, a, quite an eye on this, um, because obviously, we like to have our properties full and, and uh, actually that would help support the, uh, the dynamics of the retail components within the, those properties that we have uh, also. So if we're to look at say um, Australia as an example, um, and I'll talk to the markets where we've got properties, Canberra's probably from a physical occupancy viewpoint been around about 50%. Um, our property at Caroline Chisholm Centre is uh, probably well suited uh, really for that hybrid type working environment. Most people actually drive their car uh, to that property and um, they um, do live reasonably local um, because it is easy to live local uh, in a city like Canberra because it's actually not that big. Uh, Melbourne's probably been the market in Australia that's um, found it harder to get people back to the office and that really a lot of people are pointing to is the fact that it had such an extended lockdown uh, during uh, the COVID period. Um, we have noticed, and, and I refer to some uh, Property Council of Australia data, uh, that uh, the physical occupancy levels have actually started to improve uh, over the last couple of months, particularly after Christmas. Um, and we're starting to, to see more people in the office uh, and more employers starting to um, require their employees to spend more time in the office as well. Uh, a lot of those employers are in, uh, indicating from a cultural viewpoint uh, and a staff development viewpoint, it's better uh, to have people actually working physically together. Um, Perth, just around off Australia where our assets are, it, it's been uh, probably the strongest uh, occupancy market uh, that we've seen. Um, and certainly we are having um, occup physical occupancy numbers where, where they were Pre the pandemic. Mm. So uh, it's quite interesting. And it's probably showing why uh, Central Park in Perth has got such a relatively high occupancy uh, rate. In fact, it's probably got its best uh, building occupancy rate that we've seen in the last 10 years. Mm. Um, moving across to, to Singapore, many of the people on this call would be familiar with Singapore. Uh, certainly from what we're seeing at uh, Alexandra Technopark, the numbers are getting better. 
uh, over time um, and we are starting to uh, see more cars uh, in the car park as an example uh, and certainly uh, more people are uh, interchanging through the, the bus stops and, and walking to the train station as well. Um, down the other market to talk to in that regard for FLCT is the UK. Uh, as I said during the presentation, that is the market that has been the most uh, impacted uh, in relation to physical occupancy. Um, we would like to see more people back in, um, in our parks. Um, Blythe Valley Park outside of Birmingham, um, the exception of the three, uh, it actually does have uh, quite a few uh, people back. Its physical occupancies may be around about 60%. Um, and that's really as a consequence of the fact that the largest tenant there, or one of the largest tenants at least, being Gymshark, uh, actually requires their um, employees to work in the office five days a week. Whereas Farnborough Business Park uh, and Maxis Business Park, it's more of a hybrid um, type of arrangement. And we're only seeing occupancy levels probably around about 40 to 45 percent. Okay. Um... Well, that is a good segue into one of the questions that we have received uh, specifically regarding the uh, very low or relatively low occupancy rate in the UK property. Uh, so what are the plans of uh, FLCT uh, with regards to the low occupancy rate in the UK uh, property? Yes, um, there certainly is a theme of flight to quality uh, in relation to the UK. Um, B grade in, or lower uh, office properties are finding it very difficult to attract uh, tenants. We have, had, as you can see, uh, had a, uh, a couple of tenants actually leave our properties and we have taken the opportunity to invest in those, uh, in those buildings that they have left to bring them back up to a category A grade type standard. Uh, so we have bitten the bullet, so to speak, uh, in order to reposition those and ensure that they are attractive to uh, what the market is telling us it is seeking, which is A-grade space. Um, employers, particularly in the UK, are trying to bring people back and uh, they're, they're certainly um, deciding, I suppose, that uh, in order to do that and entice people back, they need to make sure that there is amenity and, and environment uh, in the parks uh, that they want to occupy. Uh, so we are uh, hope, hopefully delivering that outcome to them. Okay. And I guess for the listeners on this call, this is a normal uh, business as usual for REIT. So asset enhancement initiatives, it's uh, part of the cost. Um, okay. Um, next question is about the current volatility in the banking sector, as, uh, as, as you know, Rob. Um, there is a potential credit pullback from the banks, I guess, given uh, the uh, unfolding uh, events. Uh, do you expect future funding to be more restricted, especially for the office uh, assets? Well, th this is probably a good one, and she's just popped up as this question's uh, come through. A, a good one for our CFO, uh, Trisha, to talk to. Mm. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So in terms of uh, financing, we usually do it as uh, FLCT group. So we, we look at it on the group credit. So we, we don't actually, because we don't, we try not to go into secure uh, financing, um, just, just, just so that we have got the maximum flexibility. Um, and, and so in, in that sense, we don't see a pull back in credit per se. Um, yeah, in fact, um, as we talk to banks, um, there's, there's still um, balance sheet um, that, that banks are willing to avail. And because they're also becoming more selective, I mean, for, for REITs like us, which is more conservative in our capital management, I think uh, we probably stand to benefit from the continued support from our banks and even new banks. Okay. Um, well, follow on to the question, the gearing ratio for FLCT is, is actually quite good. I mean, it's 27-ish percent, right? So there is ample debt uh, headroom. So the question here is, um, well, I guess it's a rather direct question. What's holding back FLCT from uh, acquisitions as well as uh, expansions? Yeah, so I think Rob did speak about that. I mean, right now the cap rates are actually adjusting and still adjusting. So we, we are trying to be patient here um, and um, 
we do think that uh, when the right opportunity comes out, and we probably will see more in the second half of FY23, uh, we'll assess those opportunities where it makes sense uh, and DPO accretive uh, for investors. But it's really um, just that we we are still watching the market and discovering the market. With, yeah. Mm, okay. Um... All right, uh, there are two questions regarding the FX volatility. So um, as your PowerPoint has uh, put down, about 70 plus percent of your um, debt load is fixed. Um, but what about the uh, hedging strategy? So, um, you know, given the FX volatility, are there any mitigation strategies uh, to prevent uh, DPU uh, deterioration? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we do is definitely um, we enter into forwards, currency forwards, but uh, that is usually on a six months basis. So six months forward basis in line with our distribution. Um, we don't go longer than that party because we don't think that we're specialists in um, sure. FX trading. Um, so 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 we, we do, I mean, we do follow market trends, I mean, uh, on the FX front, um, but we, we also try to mitigate impact uh, through natural hedging, um, and that is uh, weighted also against the cost of debt in the various currencies. Um, so I guess there's two things: it's just uh, for, for forward hedging for FX and uh, natural hedging. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. There is a sp specific question about the Queensland property. So. Um, this investor has noted that there, there is a negative rent reversion in, in the Queensland property. Uh, is this a sign of a broader market softening in the uh, in Queensland? Uh, no, it, it, it is not. Um, Queen, the Queensland market is uh, still strong. It's showing, um, certainly in the last 12 months, uh, very good market rental growth. Really, that one deal um, was a deal that had been done quite a number of years ago. This is the orig original lease deal. Um, I actually negotiated it, and it, it was actually growing at um, quite a strong rate over the last few years. And notwithstanding the fact that in the last 12 months or so in Queensland, we've had maybe 15% market rental growth, the preceding years had actually had strong fixed annual increases at a relatively high base. So in that instance, uh, we did actually see a, unfortunately, a, a negative reversion, but that was really as a consequence, as I said, of those strong fixed annual increases, but that uh, I would call that, hopefully I will call that a one-off and we should actually see more uh, positive reversions going forward. Okay. Um, there is a question here about uh, FLCTs, um, NAV, and a DPU. Um, if there is a scenario where the CPI inflation remains high, but interest rates hit lower for whatever reason, and I guess this is uh, in a scenario where there's a recession, um, are there any risks to CPI indexation clauses for your lease rental agreements? Um, but yeah, for those ones that have CPI referencing, um, whilst they can go up, they can go down as well. Um, so there would be potentially um, some impact on, on those leases as well. And we're, we're probably more so talking about the European industrial properties. That doesn't seem to be the case in Australia. We, we have fixed annual increases, uh, both across our commercial and industrial properties. Mm. Okay. Um, there is a question here about uh, what is the impact to the REIT uh, because of higher utility costs? Okay, uh, good question. Um, we have had that question in the past as well. Uh, really, from an industrial viewpoint, uh, the utility costs are a pass, well, it's not even a pass through. It's actually a, a direct contract between the tenant and the, the utility provider. So we are not actually a party to that. So that covers about 68% of our portfolio already. Uh, with the uh, uh, other commercial properties, typically our utilities bills in Australia as well as the UK covers the common areas. We don't resell back to the tenants. 
for their tenant usage uh, uh, of electricity, it, it's a direct, once again, arrangement between the utilities provider and, and the tenant. So we, we are only really impacted, I suppose, by uh, any vacant area, which doesn't use much electricity in any case, as well as the common areas, which we then pass through back to the tenants um, in any case. So that just leaves us back to Singapore, which is about 10% of our income. Uh, there is some impact that is uh, borne by um, FLCT as a result of the fact that we do actually uh, contract directly with the energy provider and then pass that through uh, to the tenant. Uh, it's better now than it was six months ago. Um, I can say that. But it, it, whilst it would have had some impact, it would have only been on 10% of the portfolio in any case. Mm. Okay. So I guess if the tenant switches on the air conditioner and lives it on for like the whole year, they'll be on the hook to pay for it, yeah. Uh, actually, I think air conditioning is treated separately. It's more so the lights. Okay. All right. Um, one last question. This is on the uh, Google, right? So Google is returning space at Alexandra Techno Park. Um, so the question here is, uh, how challenging would it be to, excuse me, to, to find a, another tenant to take over that, uh, that space? Yeah, well, obviously we would like to have Google staying within uh, Alexandra Techno Park first and foremost. And in fact, they will be staying for uh, at least the duration of their current lease for um, over 50% of their space uh, in that park until 20, uh, the end of 2024. Mm -hmm. um, so that does mean that we have um, uh, about a couple of floors to, to lease uh, at building A of uh, ATP. Uh, as CK uh, said during the presentation, we do have, uh, we, they have given us 12 months advance notification. So we are actually out actively trying to lease that space at the moment. Um, we have done some larger deals there uh, in the past. So whilst I certainly don't want it to be vacant, um, that is a park that has leased up quite well. Uh, it's good space. It's uh, well priced in relation to the market. Uh, and I do think we will be able to actually uh, lease that space. Okay. Well, that's all the questions that we have uh, today. Uh, again, thank you very much, Rob, Trisha, and CK for joining us. Uh, very grateful that we, that you could uh, you know shed light on all the questions that our investors had. So, uh, very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for the insightful sharing. We have come to the end of the session and uh, this afternoon, if you miss any part of today's uh, session, you can re-watch the webinar on SEAS YouTube channel. Proper Connect is a bi-monthly webinar. Um, do visit our website to get updates on our upcoming investor education program and initiative. The upcoming Proper Connect will be featuring LMS compliance on the 4th of April. Once again, thank you for joining us. Have a good afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>